is a love for those who hate us. The Muslim is not the enemy. He is the one for whom Christ died. It's my job to love you even if you don't love me. It's hard, but it is exactly what Jesus did for us. One of the major objections that Muslim apologists, that Muslim philosophers and scholars will present was the Trinity. They cannot possibly fathom how God can be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the same moment. Who is Jesus talking to? Himself? Does that make him schizophrenic? And I always use very natural, simple illustrations. There's nothing that we can find that absolutely dictates truth on the Trinity. We know that the Bible teaches the Trinity. We know God is triune. But how do we in our limited, finite minds understand uh, the infinite? But I do use simple things that draw us to it. I will usually pause and say, why does that cause you any trouble? Space is a trinity. And remember, in our world, space is something that's very important. And I will point to some point in the air, and I will say, you see this point at the end of my fingernail? That is depth and height and width simultaneously. Why does that cause you a problem? I will point to my watch, and I will say, time is trinity. This moment that we're talking is both past, present, and future simultaneously. Why does that cause you a problem? Because I cannot understand it in the physical sense. I just explained two physical things. Yes, but this is a trick. It's not a trick. It's three dimensions. Now, am I saying God's three-dimensional? I'm saying that God is infinitely greater than our illustrations. But it isn't hard to fathom it if you understand that there's so many other analogies that seem to point us to the fact the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one substance, three persons, triune. Because if he's not, then the Bible's wrong. Because if the Bible's wrong, it references God the Father as God, God the Son as God, and God the Spirit as God. If that's wrong, the rest of it's made up too. They will ask, well, who, who then was Jesus talking to? I said, to the Father. But he said he did not come to do his will, but the Father's will. I said, while he was on the earth, yes. Well, he said he did not know when he would return in the Bible. That's right. He knows now. Well, then why on earth did he not know? Because when Jesus was on the earth, he didn't lay aside his God part. He laid aside his divine prerogatives. Jesus walked from Jerusalem to Jericho. Could he have blinked his eyes and flown? Of course. Could he have walked through walls? Of course. Could he have just transcended time and space? And, and Of course. He chose, by his divine will, to walk. Why? His identity with humanity. And part of his identity with humanity as a perfect human, as well as perfect God, was that he chose to self-limit his divine prerogatives. There were times where it leaked out, like the Mount of Transfiguration. But he chose, while on earth, to lay aside his divine will and thus he becomes the work of the Father. Who is Jesus talking to? Well, even in the Quran, Surah 3 teaches that Jesus spoke from the cradle, that he said, I am a messenger of Allah. The Quran teaches the virgin birth, the pure birth. The Quran teaches that Jesus formed a clay bird. The Quran teaches that Jesus spoke as an infant, as a newborn. The Quran teaches that Jesus did many clear signs. Who did that for him? Well, they will say, Allah. Why? Well, because he is a messenger. Why? Because Allah will do what he wants. There you go. If God is God, he's beyond anything you can ask. It brings us to the point of understanding that even in Islam, though they believe they are so rational, there are things that they don't have answers to. That doesn't mean they don't believe him. I'm simply showing that the Trinity is, is rational, cogent, understandable, but it's infinite. The liberation that comes from salvation is the freedom of knowing that I fear God out of reverence, out of love, but I am free from judgment. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 
that he loves me warts and all. The fear of being perfect when you first get married. You're afraid your wife will see what you look like when you wake up. You fear that she's going to see that you don't always smile when you're supposed to. You're going to fear that she's going to see a glimpse of your anger. And then she sees those things. And you're amazed that she doesn't leave. God loves me, and he already knows those things. God loves us. He already knows all of our faults. God loves you, and he already knows your doubt, your fear, your angst, your terror. And yet he still loves you. The only thing that could compel that is the heart of God. For my Christian friends, I pray for their patience. We have a tendency to give up too quickly. I have been waiting now for 24 years for the salvation of the rest of my family. I can't stop praying. When I pray for them, I wish I could pray, Lord, save them and, and you know, do it against their will, but he, he doesn't work that way. So what I pray is for God to put people in their path where they, the person will not only tell them the gospel, but be aware of the opportunity to share mercy and grace, the atonement, salvation, in, in such a way that it's understandable. A lot of us hide behind big words. I mean, it's the world I live in as a theologian or as a, as a scholar. I don't, I don't like using those words because I would much rather be understandable than to be uh, highly honored. So I pray that God puts people in their lives that will tell them the gospel so clearly that they understand the relief that comes from not having to live by scales. Instead of living by the scales, I live by the cross. Both look like a balance. But in this way, I have to do on the cross. On the cross, he did for you.